Welcome to this video coverage for the 13th round of this um, candidates tournament. And um, this is about the game Andrekin playing white against Aronian playing black. Yeah, while well, Andrekin is on, now I need to think about this, minus one. Oh, it's uh, tough to keep the standings uh, um, in my head. Minus one. And um, Aronian is on plus one, so he's um, at least got the theoretical chance before this game to overtake Arnold. He's um, trading Arnold by one point. So in case Arnold uh, should lose against um, Kayakin in this round, Aronian with a win could actually uh, tie the score. So he uh, basically needs to play in a way that uh, keeps his options open, trying to trying to win if um, Arnold should uh, make some some mistake in, in this game. So let's see what happens. d4 played, knight f6. And bishop g5, the Trompowski attack or Trompowski attack. And uh, this is one of uh, Andrakin's uh, openings. He had uh, played the Trompowski and uh, also related openings like uh, this, the Tori attack very successfully in the World Cup tournament last year in um, in Tromso, Tromso, Norway. Um, he played, played this very successfully in his rapid games and also tournament games, uh, beating many strong players with those kind of, um, yeah, kind of, let's say, slightly offbeat openings. It's not, uh, it's not like, um, let's say very rare or very exotic, but still not thought to be very critical. But he got quite playable positions and scored uh, really heavily. So what has Aronian prepared for this? He certainly needed to prepare something against the Trompowski. Played the move g6 after three minutes, which, which is a bit strange, to, to be honest. I mean, uh, it was certainly one of the openings that uh, could be expected. Of course, I know Andrekin is playing all kinds of openings. He's played an e4, d4, knight f3, everything. But uh, there was uh, some likelihood that uh, this opening should uh, could, could arise. So I'm always um, surprised that they take some time, sometimes in the, in the very first moves. Well, you never know, maybe he was just... Uh, I don't know, getting a new coffee because uh, the one he got was cold or so, but uh, okay, let's see what happens. White takes and he takes f. G6 is obviously inviting the capture. It's um, basically saying, okay, I'm just ignoring what you're doing and uh, please take so I get the bishops. Okay, and Draken uh, was happy to oblige, took on f6 and now played the move c4. Yeah, here it is an interesting, uh, um, an interesting uh, question how white should uh, set up his pieces and in what particular move order he should do that. It's pretty clear that after this capture, white has a, a setup that he would like to play. But um, how exactly in which move order is the question. Um, a very normal way to do it is like that. I'm just putting it on the board. Let's say e3, bishop g7, g3, castles, bishop g2 f5, knight e2, d6, c4, c6, knight c3. This is why it's set up. This is what he wants to do. And uh, generally speaking, this is um, a pretty comfortable setup for white. I actually uh, have played uh, this on the black side a couple of times, not in tournament chess, but uh, in, in, in blitz. When I was looking for some easy uh, antidote against the Trompowski, I thought, well, maybe g6 is the kind of move that... Uh, it's a bit of an in-your-face move, like, okay, I don't care what you're doing, just uh, take it and uh, I don't care. But um, the reality is that this type of position is rather comfortable for white. He's got a ready-made plan like rook b1, b4, b5. This is just a, a good piece on uh, on g2 and black structure is not it's not so healthy. The the double pawn itself is not uh, such a problem. It's not not a weak double pawn, but it restricts this bishop and uh, you don't really know what to do with this piece. It's not a very comfortable position, in, in my opinion. The question, however, is what move order exactly? And um, Andrekin is now playing 
playing it with C4. And this is interesting. It's not the most common move order. The one uh, that I actually just put on the board with E3 and G3 is um, is more um, more usual. But what it does is if you start with E3, black might actually decide that bishop g7 is not such a great uh, thing after all and might play d5. And then we got an entirely uh, different type of uh, type of game where let's say um, something like that could happen just uh, to show uh, something completely different. And now black castles plays f5. We have an open center or let's say a more open center now and white is not being shadowed. It leads to a completely uh, different position that black might prefer to the setup with f5 that I just showed with f5 bishop g7. And what did Andre can do? He played c4 as mentioned. And this is interesting because it's directed against those kind of early d5 moves. Now d5, I mean, okay, this uh, cannot be so great because you just take on d5. So um, it's not so clear what black should do now. You can always switch back to this, but probably uh, not what uh, what you want to do. Yeah, Aronian did something else. Check. He gave this check after some thought. So uh, he was basically at this moment uh, playing on his own, not based on any sort of preparation. We are also already in uh, pretty much uh, unknown uh, unknown territory. This is uh, almost never played in my uh, database of, what is this, six million games or something. Um, there are four games with this position, so they both uh, needed to think on their own. Um, and to be honest, I don't like at all what uh, Aronian is now doing. He gives, okay, he gave the check, okay. Knight to d2, and now he played the move c5, which probably was uh, the the plan when he went for this check. But um, I don't know. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm a player that I, I try to keep um, keep a healthy pawn structure, and I simply simply uh, don't think that this could be a healthy structure. After a3, he also needs to take, I mean, he's giving up his, his bishop. Check. I mean, okay, yeah. it, it's a bishop pair. So the, the, the trump that black got, black's trump in the trump very often is the bishop pair. And uh, he gave it away. Now it took on d4. We, we got to this position and this simply looks uh, looks very uncomfortable to me. It's uh, also now very uh, tricky out to get, even get your, your your bishop out. I mean, what he did, I think, uh, is the relatively best solution. I took here, check. gave this check, and then put the queen on e5. But what kind of opening uh, result is that? Black is, has got this bad bishop on c8. He's got uh, a destroyed pawn structure. And, uh, I mean, I was mentioning that black uh, ideally would have some kind of winning option in this game, trying to, I don't know, somehow do something, because in case Anand loses and so on, but how is Black ever going to win a game uh, in this uh, in this position? So I think it's just a bit of an opening mishap by Aronian here. Somewhat, um, I don't know, incomplete or strange preparation. And um, this seems, seems very, very comfortable for white. Yeah, and Drakin now castled long, which looks funny with this with this open uh, situation on the queen side, but okay, his king is still perfectly safe. There also was the move rook d1, which uh, seems uh, quite promising. Okay, but long castles and now a5. Yeah, black must do something. So we try to open up the queen side, which was uh, denied. B5 played, now D6. Yeah, of course, if white now takes... Check. Check. Everything's uh, more than fine for black. So queen D6, of course, to be avoided. Check. But uh, he just uh, he just took on E5. And now played G3, trying to get the bishop on this long diagonal. Yeah, this position, I think, uh, should be... Should be slightly better for white. I mean, 
as mentioned, I didn't like his uh, his his play, uh, Black's play, but it's not like it's disastrously bad his position. It just feels like um, Black does not have much uh, in terms of uh, terms of active play. Um, bishop e6, bishop g2. This is just a very strong bishop on g2. Aronia took on uh, on c4, which is probably the way to go. Not much else. Takes on b7. Check. Now this uh, this check. Yeah, what uh, what is happening now? The b5 pawn is uh, attacked, and uh, White only really has one way one way to play this, and this is with a4. Bishop b3. And this, of course, has uh, needed uh, was needed to uh, to calculate beforehand. This is a double attack on the rook and the pawn on a4, and um, uh, Andrekin is going for an exchange sacrifice. Not a very uh, difficult decision, to be honest, because you quite um, clearly see that uh, after this capture and rook takes, which is not played in the game. Um, that after this that white has a very substantial compensation this is in itself quite good limiting black's rooks and it's a dangerous pawn but white only has uh, also has this idea of course getting at the e5 pawn and if he wins this pawn two connected passes on the queen side are super strong and there also is this uh, idea to march up the king all the way to c5 push the pawn. I mean, white has very definite compensation. We can uh, continue this line because this is a critical position of the game, really, as Aronian did not take the exchange. But okay, let's uh, look at this a bit more. Um, it's not so easy to determine what uh, black's best plan is. I actually liked the suggestion of, uh, of the engine here. Fudini is to play h5. The idea is to push quickly h4 and activate the rook right from the h-file. If white goes h4, you can play g5 and activate like that. Yeah, trying to take and actually go rook g8, g4. Oh, sorry, this was too much, too many moves back. So I think white should probably uh, allow h4, not go h4 himself. Um, and um, yeah, this means that probably rook d7 is the move to look at. Let's say h4. Uh, this is not not forced. I'm just uh, trying to to show um, a sample line. If white now goes um, pawn hunting, black has got very quick play with rook to h2, and I'm not sure that uh, this is a good idea for white. This could easily backfire. For instance, if I really take now, there's rook f2, and uh, you cannot even uh, keep e2. I mean, this is not really a move. Probably rook a7 is uh, is too greedy, and bishop d5 is to be preferred, attacking on uh, on f7. Um, yeah, here. Check. After this, let's say the situation is not clear to me. It's uh, after rook c4. There's rook d4, for example. After bishop c4, there's rook d4. Uh, black has definite counterplay. And um, I'm not sure really uh, if um, white has any uh, any real advantage here. It's it's just very complicated and can be continued. But I don't want to do a, a ten move a deep line. In any case, I think uh, Heronian should have grabbed the exchange. He, he took on a4, and after rook d5, you have a big problem. B5 is now protected, and this bishop is very much offside. Uh, king e7 played and uh, king to a3 yeah um can you trap um, can you trap the the bishop is a is a big question what about rook a1 here for example this bishop does not have any square but black has uh, this move a very good defensive idea threatening rook takes e6 and um, here it's quite funny white has no way to uh, to move the bishop to some some meaningful spot if you go king here, there's bishop b3, the quite funny move. Yeah, again, using this pin. Rook a1 is not uh, not that promising. He played uh, king to um, to a3, which is the right move. Bishop must go here. 
Check. Rook d7, check. King back to f8. And now um, he played the move um, e4. Yeah, here you can argue it's possible that uh, maybe bishop d5 was uh, was even stronger. After bishop d5, there is rook b5 and rook c1. It's um, it's interesting because black now can uh, sacrifice back here on d5. And now we treat with the bishop. And I'm not 100% sure that this is actually a win for white. It might be, it might be, but I'm not on not 100 sure. Um, it's in in essence an, an exchange Check. up because look here, and white will also um, gain the this pawn of course. Let's say um, yeah, let's go there immediately. Um, this could be a win because f6 might fall, and if f6 falls, like king all the way here, and attack it with the rook twice. Then, uh, then this might be a, a real win. Other than that, it could be could be tricky. Um, maybe Andrekin wasn't one hundred percent sure about that, and he went e four for that reason. It keeps um, White's advantage uh, in intact. Uh, a four, Bishop to b three. Yeah, they went to uh, this uh, this double rook end game. Which is of course still very very favorable for white. It's um, it's I'm not sure if it is a winning position, but it's it's very very close. Check. Let's um, continue for a bit. And uh, up to this up to this point, exactly here is uh, is a critical spot. Again, um, they both were a bit uh, low on time. Five minutes something left. So. Not a really comfortable situation. In this uh, position, Aronian um, needed to play rook to b8. Just um, basically um, staying <clears throat> and not uh, not doing anything. Um, okay, white is better. Yeah, there's uh, there's this um, dangerous uh, pawn on b6. So no question is that white is calling the shots here. But um, the thing is, what he did is he took on f2, as mentioned, um, not with so much, so much time um, available, but this is um, simply a direct loss, because white now invades with the king. This is why he needed to stay on the c file. And now this is an important move, rook a to a5, always allowing for this um, rook shields if uh, black is going for for any checks here check this was played rook d6 check yeah little time so we can easily repeat check. once <clears throat> and now white is ready to march the pawns check here we go and in case of this you always just have rook to uh, b5 check this was in fact played check Check. And here, Aronian resigned. There is uh, nothing left. You can um, go here. There's Rook A8 coming. Yeah. Check. It uh, it was really decisive that he allowed the White King to uh, to enter. With Rook B8, um, he could have put up um, still some some resistance. It would have been um, a very uncomfortable position, but uh, still possible to. Um, to uh, to fight uh, to fight for a bit, yeah. Some I'm really puzzled about this opening. I mean, if you really want uh, to have some 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 sort of chance to win, I think this is really a bit of a bit of a non-starter. And uh, it really it really felt like uh, he didn't have anything great prepared um, prepared against the and then against the trump. I mean, this is surprising. It's one of his uh, one of Andrekin's openings. Um, and there are many um, lines available for black that uh, can lead to um, uh, some somewhat more dynamic play. Yeah, like uh, let's say um, let's say c5, for example, uh, trying to provoke this this capture or do something like that, which admittedly is dangerous business. But okay, you want to win a game, you need to need to uh, to risk something. 
All right, so a loss for Aronian, which means he's out of it, regardless of what Arnett is doing. He's falling back to a 50% score with that. While Andraken is on 50% now. He really has fought back. And um, in general, I think he would... Uh, he, I, I uh, at least I assume that he considers uh, this tournament to be a success for him. He's on 50% now in uh, the toughest possible field uh, imaginable, really. Okay, yeah, well, we don't have cards and we don't have Nakamura's, what's, whatever. But it's a super strong tournament. He does not have much experience in those. And getting to 50% uh, over, this, uh, over 13 games is really a good result for him. And of course, a good win in this game. Rafferonia in this tournament um, is very uh, disappointing again, like um, just like um, last year. All right, I do a resume of the the tournament anyway. Resume, this is an English word. I'll do um, I do a summary of the whole tournament anyway in the final videos for round fourteen. All right, thanks for watching.